Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure update. It's the 10th of October and thank goodness back home. As always, we have the chapters. So you can jump to any particular update you care about the most. New videos this week. So I dived into how you're using multiple clouds. Azure, obviously, but maybe AWS, GCP, Oracle, whatever it is. There's many considerations around that, but from a networking perspective, what are your options to connect the resources together? So I explore it in this video. There's no magic solution to it. It's using the familiar concepts you know about. It's just how we can kind of optimize those configurations. So we dive into thinking about connecting the different clouds together. So on to, on to what's new. So the static web app database connection is being retired. Uh, end of November. Now it was public preview anyway, but basically they're deprecating it. Instead, use a self-hosted data API builder in your app. So that makes it really easy to go and connect to those various data services via an API that it creates for you. So you want to go ahead and move to that. I can now use the Azure CLI, kind of an AZAKS command, for AKS migrations. And for my migration, we're talking about, I'm using availability sets today, which remember use different racks, so fork domains, but I wanna move instead to the new VM node pool where I can use things like availability zones and also move from a basic load balancer to a standard load balancer. So in a single command, an AZ AKS update, I can make that conversion. Also, the AKS Kato add-on is now GA. So this is an AI toolchain operator. So it enables me to really easily deploy and operate various types of models. So I could use it for inferencing. I may want to do fine tuning on it, but it's when I'm hosting those models on my AKS cluster, this is a way to really manage all of those. Also for Azure Kubernetes services, if I'm using Windows node pools, the use of the Network Policy Manager is being retired uh, end of September 2026, so a year's time. Now, depending on what functionality you're using will modify how I solve that going forward. So maybe I can just use network security groups on the network. Maybe I want to use things like Project Calico, which is an open source Kubernetes networking solution, but it has security, it has observability, so I can replace the functionality I was using in Network Policy Manager with something else. On the networking side, so the virtual private network gateway, so this is where, hey, I'm using tunnels to connect different networks together, normally over the internet. Well, the SSTP option is being phased out. Basically, it's inferior compared to things like Ike v2 and OpenVPN. Both of those offer better performance, better scale. So it's being retired year and a half's time. So instead, move to one of those other protocols. Now, if you have a really old on-premise VPN gateway, you're going to need to replace that on-premise VPN gateway solution to be able to use Ike v2 or the open VPN. So start planning now and make that move. So Azure Firewall now supports up to 600 IP groups per policy. So the whole point of an IP group is it's a list of IP addresses. It could be single IPs, multiple IPs. Um, IP address ranges. And so I create these groups of those IP addresses so I can then reuse those particular groups in various places. I could use it across DNAT rules, network rules, application rules. It saves me having to constantly recreate those specific IPs. Well, now in a single rule, I can include up to 600 of those IP groups. Previously, it was 200. So a much better uh, scale capability. And then for Azure Firewall Secured Hub, so I'm talking about Azure Virtual WAN, and it's a secured hub using Azure Firewall, I can now bring my own IP address. So the public IP address that it uses can now be from a prefix you have brought to Azure. So that's going to be useful where maybe I've already got something going, where there's an allow list going on, and I want a consistent IP address usage for those other systems because of what they allow, because of the policies they have. So you can now bring your own. On the storage side, so the general purpose V1 storage accounts, which are really, really old by now, and even the legacy blob, they're being retired in a year's time, October 2026. 20, 
I mean, you want to be using the general purpose V2 storage account anyway. It takes a lot of the great features we had and brings it all into one place. Potentially, maybe you want to use the newer specialized block blob storage or the file storage. It really depends on your requirements. If you don't do anything and you're using general purpose V1, then it will auto migrate after October 13th, 2026 to a general purpose V2. So technically you could sit back and do nothing, but realize it's going to automatically happen in a year's time. So unmanaged disks are being retired in six months time. So this was the original type of disk we could use with our virtual machines. It was really, it sat on top of a page blob. And so there was certain management we had to do in terms of, well, how many of those did we have per storage account? Because you could only have so many and so many IOPS. Basically you want to use managed disks today, which abstract away any underlying storage. This date has been pushed. It was originally September 2025. Now it's, hey, you've got another six months, but you need to go and move to managed disks because those unmanaged disks are going away. Azure NetApp Files has some new authentication methods to be used as part of the TLS encryption for the NFS v3 and v4.1 volumes. So now basically it's other LDAP services. So uh, free IPA, open LDAP, Red Hat directory server can all be used as part of those LDAP services used for the encryption of the traffic to the volume. And Azure NetApp Files now supports cross-tenant customer managed key in GA. So when I think about the volume encryption, if we want to do a customer managed key, well, that key lives in a key vault. With the cross tenant, that key vault can actually be in a different subscription under a different tenant. Now, where that's normally useful is I'm a software as a service provider, a SaaS solution. And my customers want to be able to manage the key that's used for the encryption of their data in my service. So if my service is using Azure NetApp files, what I can now enable my customers to do is they can keep control of the key that is used to encrypt the traffic in my SaaS service. So then they can roll the key as they want. They could revoke access, which eventually would kill access to the data under that SaaS provider. So the ability to have this now means SaaS providers can use Azure NetApp files and let their customers um, still control the key and the encryption of the data. Uh, the Azure NetApp file short-term clones has gone GA. So this is a temporary fin clone that is created on top of an existing volume snapshot. So I don't have to do a full copy and it can be used for up to 32 days and it's only going to store the incremental changes. So if I want to do a quick test, some analytics, uh, a DR, but I don't want to go through all of the work of creating a full copy of the data, then these short-term clones can be really useful on potentially an even a really large data set. So this is a nice capability to have. And the Azure Data Lake, so the Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2 now supports a vaulted backup in preview. So when I enable that hierarchical capability on a storage account and I create it, instead of regular blob, I get a data lake. So it has true directory structures, it has POSIX style ACLs, uh, there's other APIs I can use. Well, now with the vaulted backup, it will actually take the data and store it in another location. It's not just like a snapshot on the same media as the base data lake. So it gives me better resilience from various types of malicious activity, accidental activity. And then I can take advantage of the backup service capabilities, uh, long-term retention up to 10 years. I can use multi-user authorizations. So that's really important when I don't want the ability for a single actor to be able to go and, hey, turn off and delete the backups. I have to get another person to authorize, hey, you can elevate up to be able to manage those backups. So it stops any kind of bad actor getting a credential and then doing negative things to my backup. Database side. So Postgres SQL, there's some new minor versions, 17.6, 16, 10, 15, 14, 14, 19, 13, 22. 18 beta 3 are now all supported as part of the Postgres Flexible Server. Remember, this is just going to happen automatically in your next maintenance window. Azure Cache for Redis is being retired. Now, I think, is it the basic standard premium, the first three all run on open source version of Redis, they're retiring in three years time. So end of September 2028. The enterprise two SKUs, they're actually going to retire end of March 2027, so that's earlier. And what you want to be moving to is the new Azure Managed Redis. 
So with Azure Managed Redis, all of the SKUs are built on enterprise. All of the SKUs have the same capabilities. I pick different virtual machine SKUs based on the ratio of memory to processor. So I'm really balancing that capacity because it's an in-memory database versus performance. So I have a lot more control. So you need to go and move to that. Um, Azure MySQL Flexible now has a custom port in GA. Normally it's port 3306, that's the default. But now during the creation, I can pick a custom port from the 25,001 to 26,000 that would be used for both public and private. I can only have one custom port, but now I can change that if I want to. On to the miscellaneous. So System Center Operations Manager Managed Instance is being retired this time next year. So this was a managed version of Ops Manager and basically uh, it's, it's retiring away. If you want that functionality, you need to go back to managing your own version of Ops Manager on your own OS instances. Maybe you could use Azure Monitor for Arc enabled OS instances. It really depends on which functionality you're using, how much of those more powerful management packs uh, you need. So obviously OpenAI had a big set of announcements this week. Microsoft's partnership with OpenAI means those models come to Azure and AI Foundry as well. So the GPT-5 Pro, this is the advanced reasoning and analytics, um, really good for complex analytics for code generation, intelligent decision-making, hey, that's available. GPT-5 Chat, so it's got better safety guardrails for maybe more sensitive conversations all around that responsible AI, but that more interactive chat, that's available. GPT Image 1 Mini, GPT Real-Time Mini, and GPT Audio Mini are now available. So that's real-time image, voice, audio generation. And because they're mini, it requires less infrastructure, less cost. So it's really all about that speed, affordability, but it will still really easily integrate with existing workflows. There's a GPT-5 codex, which is obviously specifically aimed at AI coding assistance scenarios. And Sora 2 is coming soon to Foundry. So that's that really advanced video and audio generation within a single API. So physics-driven animation, synchronized dialogue, dynamic media creation, uh, those are all coming. As part of the content safety and the content filter capabilities of AI Foundry, they now have PII detection. So there's a whole bunch of existing checks, um, categories of different types of content, uh, violence, harm, et cetera, um, copyrighted material, types of um, prompt attack, jailbreaking attacks. But it will now also identify and block personally identifiable information from the large language models output. So that will help ensure your privacy. And then Azure Arc Firmware Analysis is in GA. So Azure Arc normally extends the Azure control plane to other operating systems, to Kubernetes environments, and then layers down other services. But it can now also analyze the firmware of your IoT or network devices. Now there's no agent required on the device. I'm gonna take the firmware image, I upload it to the cloud where it's inspected for vulnerabilities, um, weak security configurations, if it finds hard-coded credentials, inventories of software, and we'll give you a full comprehensive report about that firmware. So that is now GA. And that is it. As always, I hope that is useful. Till next video, take care.